So Prince is dead. And I've been pretty fucking broken up about it ever since I found out yesterday at the end of my work day. Um, I wanted to talk about it yesterday in a video, but I was just in no fit state. I haven't really been able to think straight ever since I found out. I actually took the day off work today because I needed to mourn. And that's not something that normally happens when you're talking about people who I know because they're famous. Um, I've been sad about the death of famous people before, you know, just sad in, 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 oh, that's a bummer kind of a way, you know. But there are a few artists whose death has really hit me hard. The first one was Freddie Mercury. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I was coming up for 15 years old, I think, when Elvis Presley died, and my mom cried for an hour, and I, and I was like, Mom, why are you crying? He's, you know, he's, Elvis was just a singer. You never met him. You never saw him live. What, what, why are you so upset? And she's like, I loved him. I loved him. And I just, I thought she meant that she had a crush on him. And maybe she did, but I don't think that's what she actually meant when she said she loved him. Anyway, but when Freddie Mercury died in 1991, I finally understood. Um, because when I found out Freddie died, I was absolutely blown away because I didn't really realize how much Queen and Freddie Mercury actually had meant to me until Freddie died, and then I was, I, I felt like the wind was taken out of my sails. I just couldn't believe it. Earlier this year, when David Bowie died, I was beside myself that whole day. The guys at work kept on teasing me about it as well. You know, it's, are you okay, Paul? And all that kind of shit. Uh, they were taking the piss out of me as well. And there's no way I could face that today because with the death of Prince, if someone tried to pull that shit, thinking it was funny, I would probably fucking punch them. And I'm not a violent person. Uh, punching someone doesn't even normally cross my mind, but don't take the piss out of what Prince means to me, man. You know, it's just like... Whereas David Bowie taught me that it's okay to be weird, and you can even be weird and cool at the same time. When I was a kid, I started being a fan of David Bowie around the age of 9 or 10. And... Um, but I sort of put David Bowie's flamboyance down to his sort of bisexual nature. But when I became a fan of Prince in my later teens, um, I was pretty damn sure Prince was a heterosexual guy just like me, and yet here's this guy who's flamboyant, who was blatantly trying to act sexy and be pretty. And that's something that I sort of I identified with that so much because I don't care what this sounds like. I'm going to be really honest with you guys. You know, I, uh, when people in my life have been attracted to me personally, I would much prefer someone to think of me as beautiful than handsome. That's just me. That's how I feel about myself. You know, I'm a very sexual person as well. And um, being a sexual person, you know, how you express that sexuality, that sexuality, and your sexual core um, can sometimes be seen as you know bad taste or even taboo but Prince sort of like took that away from me he's like no 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 you can be fucking sexy you can be fucking pretty you can be beautiful and you can be masculine you can be all those same things there's no contradiction between being masculine and being pretty or being masculine and being sexy and man I felt it I felt it then I still feel it now I, you might not think of me as a sexy person now fair play whatever I don't really care but it's there. And Prince taught me that you don't have to put it away or hide it or be ashamed of it. And I can't even tell you what that's meant to me, how much confidence it's given me and how much passion for life I've been able to express through that. There's no way I could overstate it. As for the music, which is, I'm sure, how Prince would like us to remember him the most. Um, quite simply, there will never be another. And I don't mean there will ever be anyone else that does what Prince does, because that's true about any musician. But Prince was on a level of talent that you just don't get. Uh, uh, again, the only person who's even comparable to Prince is David Bowie in that regard. Um, the diversity of his musical output. 
the fact that people have written Prince off over and over again at various different times throughout his musical career, and yet he can just like pull a rabbit out of the hat whenever the fuck he wants to and go, yeah, I'll fucking blow you away this time, and then does so. You know? I became a fan uh, when I heard I Just Want to Be Your Lover. I was a DJ at a roller disco back then. And um, I liked the song, and then the next single that came out was Why You Want to Treat Me So Bad, and I liked that song too. I didn't love them or anything, but I liked them, and I noticed that my crowd seemed to like them pretty much. The first Prince album I actually bought for myself was Controversy in 1981. And that's when I sort of found out what Prince actually looked like. And that's when all this other stuff started kicking in because, you know, Prince was a little man. You know, he's like five foot two or five foot three. And quite, there's no other way to say it, he's quite petite as well. It's not just that he's short. And that being so, uh, back in the early days, before he was rich enough to afford having his own private clothes made for him, um, which has been the case for most of the past 30 years, uh, back in the day he used to wear women's clothes because they fit him better. And, uh, and he also liked the way he looked in them, of course. You know, he's uh, all about blurring the lines, you know, between... Uh... See, to me, Prince has always been unmistakably masculine. Um, but pretty, but sexy, but dirty. All those things, and by the word dirty in this, in this connotation, I mean in the, in the pornographic sense. And uh, I can identify with all that personally, myself. When it comes to the music, though, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as a lifetime fan, Prince is a genre all by himself. And there's only a couple of artists I would say that about. Um, Bowie's another one, Funkadelic is another one, uh, where their music is all by itself. It, uh, they inspired others um, and were obviously inspired by others, but they never sounded like something that other people were doing at the same time. Now, I watched a video this morning by my friend Kazum Fowler, who is dear to me on YouTube. I, 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 Kazum is the only person I'm acquainted with on YouTube that lets someone, lets his viewers further into their head than I do. So I got a lot of respect for Kazum, but he said in his video that uh, the prince we all loved died in 2001 when he became like a super religious Jehovah's Witness. And you know, I said in the comment section what I'll say now, I respectfully disagree. And, you know, when you like someone's music, the, all of our musical taste is entirely subjective, of course. And no one's opinion is more right or wrong than anyone else's opinion about whether the music was good, bad, or indifferent. But, quite frankly, uh, and I'm not saying this to Kazoom, I'm saying this to all of my audience, I've got that funk. And I'm not got that funk for no reason. You know, Prince has an awful lot of, to do with that. Um, and funk is one of the foundations of my whole psychology in terms of in terms of just how I feel about the way I express myself when I dance, for example. It's all in the funk, man. And uh, I mean, I can dance to all sorts of different kinds of music, but if I'm dancing to funk, it's on a completely different level. I am in it and it's in me and Prince man he's, he's the funkiest fucker that ever lived you know you can take your James Brown and George Clinton and say well thanks very much because you guys gave us Prince and I'm a huge fan of George and James immense especially George you know George is a legend but just to put it in perspective in my humble opinion one of the funkiest songs, probably the funkiest song ever written, ever, by anybody ever, is Erotic City by Prince. That song is so funky, the Funkadelic decided to cover it, <laughs> um, which is the ultimate tribute. I mean, if you can, if a band that you grew up admiring decides to cover one of your songs, that must be an immense feeling. I can't even imagine how Prince felt when George called him up and said, hey, do you mind if we do Erotic City? <laughs> Incredible. Anyway, so yeah, musically, I think Prince is in a genre all by himself. And I know there's plenty of people who, like Kazoom, liked his earlier music more than his later music, but I would just question how much of his later music you'd actually listen to. And by listen to, I don't mean put on in the background while you're doing something else. I mean sitting there listening to it. Listening to it. 
This is, this is a lost art with music because uh, especially now in the digital age where people don't even buy albums anymore, they consume their music a bit at a time. And often in headphones um, while they're doing other stuff, running or, you know, whatever. And I don't know, I feel sometimes like I'm one of the last people in the world who likes to just sit down and listen to an album as an experience. And it's something I do every week. Um, and yeah, sure, Prince had a lot of great music in the 80s. He's a lot of experimentally different music. You know, it, 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 the, the, the variety of what Prince can do never ceases to amaze anybody. And his talent at playing different musical instruments and, and songwriting skills, virtually second to none. But for me, uh, for a long time, I liked his 80s stuff, but then uh, I remember seeing um, Wendy and Lisa, who used to be in the, the, his band The Revolution back in the 80s, and uh, it was a, 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 a documentary about Prince's career, which was made in the early noughties. And uh, Wendy and Lisa were saying at the time that they felt his best material was in the 80s. And at the time, this is like 2003 or 4, I'm like, no way, man. His music in the 90s was way better. Diamonds and Pearls is a highly explosive, full-on funk experience. The Love Symbol album is incredible by any reckoning. Um, just the song Sexy Motherfucker all by itself. That is as pure funk as a funk song can get. It's amazing. Um, and then after that he did Come, which is a great album, but it's not of the same level as Diamonds and Pearls or the Love Symbol album. Then he did Exodus with the MPG. That one doesn't get anywhere near as many kudos as it should. It's a good album. It's not amazing, but it's good. But then the Gold Experience is fantastic. That's like 1995. Then he ditched Warner Brothers Records and put out a few albums, uh, uh, which some of which were, you know, all Prince's music is of a certain standard. It's, it's either good, great, or amazing. Uh, and, you know, the uh, music he was doing in the 90s, like from Emancipation, I think that's all good. It's like 36 albums, uh, 36 songs in that album, and it's, all of them are good songs, but none of them are going to blow you away. New Power Soul, great, loved it. So, yeah, the 90s for me uh, was Prince's best period at that time. But now, since the year 2000, Prince has put out some albums which were, uh, there are two albums which are relatively forgettable. Uh, when you compare them to the rest of his catalog, and that would be Musicology and 3121. Both of them, again, are quality albums, but they just don't stand out. Now, the album that Kazoom was probably referring to about 2001, when Prince went off on, on off the deep end for his uh, whole Jehovah's Witness thing, was The Rainbow Children. It is a religiously inspired uh, concept album, and I love it. I <laughs> think it's great. I don't have to agree with what Prince is trying to, to, to say to appreciate the music and the songs and just listen. I mean, some of the guitar playing on that album is fucking phenomenal. And uh, anyway, so from my point of view, Prince's best period is his most recent band, Third Eye Girl. Uh, as of this recording, he's done, he did three albums with Third Eye Girl. And the first one, Artificial Age, is a good Prince album by any comparison. You know, it's a good album. It's not amazing or nothing. It's good. That was 2013. Then Plectrum Electrum came out in 2014. And at the time that came out, it's a pop rock album. It's a rock album on a par with Purple Rain. It's even, it's even more of, of a rock and roll album than that. Um, and it, the, the guitar playing on Plectrum Electrum is fucking outstanding. Yeah, and, and like... At the time it came out in 2014, I couldn't believe it. I posted on my Facebook, I'm like, I can't believe the little man can still pull it out of the hat like this. This is amazing. It's the best album he's ever done. And then last year he put out Hit and Run Phase 1, which for my money is the best album Prince has ever made. And in a way, the fact that he's died so suddenly now makes me really grateful that Hit and Run is his last album. Because what a way to go out, man. What a way to go out. There is one song on there that is written, obviously, as a pop single, and it kind of stands out like a sore thumb compared to the rest of the album. But most of that album is deep in the fat funk, and it's just on a completely different level to uh, anything Prince has ever done before. And it is so highly polished and so expertly done. 
I can't possibly overstate it. If you've never heard any of Prince's newer albums, and by newer I mean since the turn of the century, here's the ones to look out for. Planet Earth, 2007, amazing. Plectrum Electrum, 2013, amazing. And Hit and Run Phase 1, 20, uh, 2015. There's plenty of others I could list off, but those ones for me uh, really stand out. And musically, you, I think I, 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 I'm just going around in circles now, so I'm going I'm to stop on that one for a second. I'm not going to bore you with the whole discography, but look at my stack of Prince vinyl. Look at that. When this album came out in 1982, it was subversive and dirty. This is obviously his most famous album, Purple Rain. The movie that went with this is pretty good. I think the acting in the movie leaves a bit to be desired, but let's face it, none of them are actors. You know, they're musicians. And um, I think they made a pretty good movie, despite that. This album, I've got two copies of. One that I've played, and this one is in pristine condition. And let me show you why. First of all, there's a poster here that I want to share with you. I've never actually opened this poster all the way up. This is uh, from the video When Doves Cry. And you see this face. I've got that face tattooed on my back. And let me show you this record, right? I've never played this. I've never touched the vinyl with my fingers because I've got purple rain on purple vinyl, baby. That is literally one of my most treasured possessions of all. If all the things that I own, if my house was on fire, I'd probably come back in to get that. I've got loads, loads of albums here, you know, I, I'm not going to go through them all, and I, I do have pretty much all of them. This album's got my favorite album cover of the 80s, I think, as an artistic statement that's fucking beautiful. You know, there he is, exposed, with his hand on his heart, this is me, this is all I am. Sexy motherfucker, on cymbal disc, baby. Go ahead, be jealous. I would be. I've got loads, I've got loads. A lot of the singles that I've got, I've got for a particular reason because what people don't know about Prince is when, the, when records were a thing, every time you had a single, you had a B-side that included a song which was not released on the album. So the single would obviously be off of an album, but the B-side would be a previously unreleased track. And so I've got loads of these 12-inch singles. Check out this one, Sign of the Times, the B-side. La, 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 he, he, he. If you've got the, um, the CD of Prince the Hits, the B-Sides, which came out like 25 years ago now, um, you'll be familiar with some of these songs of the B-Sides, yeah? But you're not familiar with the long version because they only have the 45 versions. And this song right here practically will light your phonograph on fire. Look, it even says so. Highly explosive. The little man is not kidding. That song fucking kicks ass. Most Prince fans and others will be familiar with the song Let's Go Crazy, but this is a significant single because it's the one that had Erotic City on the flip. And like I say, Erotic City, I can't think of any song funkier than that. And I am a huge fan of Prince, funk in general, funkadelic, etc., etc., Erotic City is all by itself, man. It is awesome. Last but not least, I've played this exactly twice with the needle. This came out before Prince was properly famous. Minneapolis Genius. I think he was only like 17 or 18 when he recorded this album. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, in, in illegal by itself. I played it twice. I listened to it once the first time just on my bed with my eyes closed and listening to it. And the second time I played it with a needle, I recorded it onto a cassette tape and I listened to it in my car over and over and over again for God knows how many times. So that's my album collection. I didn't want to go through all of them because I didn't want to make the video too long and boring for you. Uh, a few more things I wanted to sort of share about my fandom because I am an immense fan. Um, Check this out. Purple Rain Tour ticket stub. Wear purple. Look at that, $17.50. Now let me tell you a story about that. That concert was in February of 1985 and tickets went on sale in January. 
And me and my roommate decided that we were going to spend the night out in front of the warehouse records before the, they went on, on sale the following morning. We got there at 10.30 at night, figuring that we were going to get there before anybody else so we could get some front row seats. There was already 20 people in the queue when we got there at half past 10 at night. And we spent the night on a very cold sidewalk in Santa Rosa, California on a January night. Now, there's no other artist. There's no other person that could get me to sleep on a cold fucking cement sidewalk to buy tickets to go and see. No one else would, I would do that for. Brixton Academy, 1998. That was the new Power Soul tour. Great show. Shaka Khan opened the show. Larry Graham was playing with Prince back then. Larry Graham was with uh, Sly and the Family Stone back in the day. And uh, other members of Sly and the Family Stone came on uh, guest appearances as well. What a fantastic show. And if you're familiar with Brixton Academy, then you'll know this already, but it's not a huge venue. I think it seats maybe uh, capacities like four or 5,000, something like that. So at the time, that was a, a much more intimate concert than the one I saw at the Cow Palace, which is like, you know, 15, 16,000 people. This one, 21 Nights in London, 31 pounds and 21 pence. Prince managed to sell out 21 shows in a row in one city. That was back in 2007. He was touring Planet Earth back then. Tickets were 3121 because the previous album to Planet Earth was called 3121. And he did 31 nights in Las Vegas and then came to London and did 21 nights in London. Sold them all out. And all 21 shows were completely different. There's not very many bands that will do that. Most bands rehearse a set and they play the rehearsed set and that's it. But with Prince, he said, okay, here's a song list. And they already had you know, rehearse the songs individually. So he just give the band a song list and say, this is what we're doing tonight. And then they would go out there and do it. Another thing that Prince is famous for was the after shows. Uh, a lot of times Prince would do a, a full on show in a stadium somewhere or an arena, you know, in front of 15, 20,000 people. Then he would run out the back door as soon as the show was over, get in his limousine with the band. They would go off top speed off to a nightclub somewhere and play an impromptu concert from like two in the morning until dawn. And those were always really small settings, and it was always my aspiration to go to one of those after-show parties. Now, for the 31, uh, sorry, for the 21 nights in London, um, there were after-show parties that you could actually buy tickets for um, along with your show, but there was no guarantee that Prince was going to be at the party. As it turned out, I think he showed up for 16 of the 21 nights for the after-party, which, you know, you can't fault him. Prince obviously famously wrote the song 1999, and at Paisley Park Studios they had a, um, a Millennium Party. I've got the DVD for that called uh, Raven Till the Year 2000. And, um, you know, there's Funkadelic guest starring on that video, Lenny Kravitz guest stars, The Time guest stars on that video. And one thing I want to say about Lenny Kravitz, I mean, I've, I'm a fan of Lenny Kravitz, right? I've got a few of his albums. And when Lenny was on stage with Prince singing Lenny Kravitz songs, um, Prince let Lenny do his thing on the guitar and then basically sort of says, you know, can I have a go, whatever. And um, and then just basically rips and rips the guitar to shreds and makes Lenny Kravitz uh, look like an amateur. Not something that's, I'm sure, very easy to do. Lenny's uh, a good guitarist by any reckoning. Anyway, um, and that's another thing I want to say about Prince just briefly is I know this is a controversial thing to say, but from my point of view, Prince is the best guitarist we've ever had. And for that reason, uh, the loss is even more extreme. It's not just that we've lost a colorful, flamboyant, funky guy. We've lost a guitarist who, whose prowess on the guitar literally second to none. There's nothing he couldn't bring out of a guitar. Uh... Finally, I want to talk about another time I saw Prince live. Um, I was fortunate enough, I had recently moved to London, and uh, in 2014, um, Prince and the Third Eye Girl Band decided to come to London and do some impromptu concerts around London. And what they would do was on the website, they would announce, we're going to be at so-and-so tonight, and then people would just rush over there and stand in the queue. Well, I got a text from a friend of mine saying, hey, Paul, word is that Prince is going to be playing at Ronnie Scott's in Soho tonight. That's all I know. And uh, so I jumped on Twitter and said, I'm going to go see Prince tonight, and I'm, uh, I'm in Soho. And then I jumped in the shower, got myself dressed, got ready, checked my Twitter before I left, and one of my uh, viewers said, look, if you're not in the queue in the next five minutes, I'd forget it. 
that's already it's all that's already a huge queue and I was like shit so I scurried myself into London it takes me about an hour to get to central London from where I live and uh, I got there at a quarter to four in the afternoon I was person number 389 in the queue and the capacity for the venue was 250 but I was not going to give up my place in the queue I got there at a quarter to four I didn't get into the venue until two o'clock in the morning so I stood there for 10 hours. Eight of those hours, it was raining. I stood in the rain for eight hours to see Prince live. There's no one else I would do that for, but we're talking about Ronnie Scott's. Um, like I say, the capacity was 250. Ronnie Scott's is a legendary jazz club in center of London. And um, there were loads of famous people in there as well uh, as me and, and Prince himself was maybe 15 feet away from me and it was a fantastic show it always is I don't think Prince ever brought less than a hundred percent to his live performances and um, I'm really gonna miss him I'm really gonna miss him if uh, if you if you if you know what it's like to to love someone that you've never met then I know what you will feel like when you're bereft of that person the real killer of it for me right was literally I, I, it's been like five or six weeks or something like that since I put a video on my own channel and literally two weeks ago I was thinking oh man I really gotta put a video on my channel what should I put a video about and, and I literally just thought oh I should do a tribute video to Prince and maybe I can tweet it to him and maybe he'll actually see my video and I can tell him in a video how much I fucking thought of him and how much he meant to me and just basically say, thank you, dude. I fucking loved you, man. I loved you. Now I can't. And that's one of those things about grief, man, and bereavement is the finality of it. And the funny thing is that the real kicker of this whole story, this little last bit anyway, is that's something I make a point of doing throughout my life. I always tell the people who matter to me that they matter to me on a regular basis precisely because you never know when your fucking number is up. And that could be me one day. You know? So yeah, anyway, I want to thank you guys for watching this video. I've got my honorary purple velvet jacket on. I've got my Prince concert shirt on, which I got in Brixton. And I've been listening to Prince all night last night and all day today. And I want to thank you guys for your patience. If you watch this whole video, it's nearly half an hour long. I'm going to end by showing you a few clips of some of my outfits, which were inspired by Prince. All right. Until next time, thanks for watching. And May all your ups and downs be ups.